Good morning. All right, we're continuing with our series, I Want to Believe But, and uh, we've been looking at some stories um, in the New Testament of, of when uh, and how Jesus uh, engages a person, and we see him engaging with lots of different kinds of people. He engages with people um, with very different backgrounds, with uh, different issues and different obstacles. Um, but every conversation that we see in the Gospels, particularly the ones that we've highlighted, are ones that, that we believe um, are, are important because they're highlighting um, a, an obstacle that this person can't overcome to see the truth and to, and to really embrace what it means to actually see God for who he is and walk with him. And we think those conversations are important because when we dig down into the details of these individuals' lives, we find some commonalities even in ourselves. That many times Jesus has already addressed maybe the, even the obstacle that you have in your mind when it comes to faith, when it comes to walking with God, when it comes to elements of, of Christianity. So Jesus is willing to have the conversation. That's what we see. That throughout the Gospels, it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, we see Jesus engaging with people and he is not afraid to have the conversation. And for you and I today, we're going to talk about another important aspect with walking with God, but it's going to be a little bit different than what we've heard before, um, because this one's probably one that's a little bit different in terms of this is a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. This is a conversation that Jesus has that's going to give new meaning to something that's very, very important in your life and in my life. And so Jesus is going to talk to his disciples about friendship. And as I walked up, I, I saw that, that video playing as I came up, and I, and I thought to myself, if the studies that we're about to look at are true, then it is more likely than not that you actually may not even have a friend in which you could have that kind of honest conversation with. Um, the studies kind of bear that out. I looked, at, I looked at a study, so we're talking about friendship, and so I looked at a, a friendship on study, and this study was done in, in 2013, and it's in your notes. And the title of the study is this, The State of Friendship in America. And so this is a study that's done um, across the entire country, you know, the, the religious affiliations, age, all those things in, incorporated into it. And uh, if you have a chance, look that study up because there's a lot into it, in it that I can't get into. Um, but, but some of the highlights were this, and I thought they were pretty, they were pretty astonishing, pretty shocking even. That 75% of Americans are not satisfied with their friendships. Meaning as they sort of assess their friendships. They're not happy with what they see. They're not happy with the level that they're experiencing friendship. Even further, 63% would say that their friends they already have, that they are not, they're not really confident in those friendships. Meaning that if, if things got bad, if things you know, went south in their lives, that the, the friendships that they do have wouldn't really be able to help carry that weight. So we're, we're not satisfied with our friendships and we're not even really confident in the friends that we have. And so I thought, okay, so 2013, you know, that, that, that maybe has to do with maybe social media where we're really, really connected, but we're not really, really connected with people. Maybe that's it. Um, but the studies kind of bore out that, that using social media or the use of social media had really no impact on the statistics and neither did age. That every, literally every, across the board, the numbers of the level of dissatisfaction and the level of confidence are about the same. And women say they have more access to intimate friendships, but they're actually just as dissatisfied with their friendships as men. And so I thought, okay, 2013, that's seven years ago. That's an older study. Like maybe, maybe things have changed. Maybe, maybe something new has happened. And then I ran across a study in 2019 that says that the average American hasn't made a new friend in five years. So we've become so, so like disillusioned with friendship that we literally just, we stopped making friends, right? Um, and, and I think... And I'll reference C.S. Lewis. Uh, he writes a book um, not specifically about friendship, but he references friendship a lot. And so I want to reference him a few times. And he made this observation in the mid-20th century. He said that it, it makes a lot of sense that our culture and we as human beings don't put as much value on friendship. And he said, first of all, friendship is the, is the one sort of love that doesn't really force itself on us. Right, because he talks about familial love, right? Love of family, right? We can't avoid that, right? Whether that's good or bad, I don't know your situation, but we can't avoid that. We're we're, we're getting that no matter what. And then he talks about eros or or ro romantic, erotic love, and he said that there, you know there's a biological component to, component to that one. So we're not we're not avoiding that one at all either. And it makes sense that that is the one that that our culture tends to gravitate towards. And he made the case even back then, and it's certainly true now, that if you look at our culture. And we compared the works, we compared the, the books, 
uh, the TV shows, the movies, the articles, the publications that are dedicated towards describing or celebrating or um, romanticizing or um, wanting us to pursue romantic love. If we took all of those publications, all of those works, all of those things, we could fill this entire building with it. Right? You, you would never be able to read it all. You would never be able to watch it all. There is such a wide breadth and depth of, of information and, and stories of written and shows written about romantic love that we, you couldn't watch it all. And he made the point then, and it's still true now, that if you uh, could compare that with the same level of writing, the same um, movies, TV shows, articles written specifically about friendship, like maybe it would fit on this stage in a box somewhere, maybe, right? And so our, our culture, we, we've, we've, we've placed romantic love and erotic love at, at sort of like the, the pinnacle of what it means to be human. And what's left really is friendship, right? And I laughed because like I laughed hysterically because my wife and I got into an argument yesterday um, about the show Friends. Because I made the case that even the show with friends in the title isn't about friendship. And she argued with me about that. But I was like, 75% of the main characters end up together. That's not about friendship. There's no friendship in that, right? Like, yes, there. If, if, you, if you removed all of the romantic elements out of that show, all of it, that show lasts like 20 minutes, maybe? I don't know. Maybe 20 minutes? It doesn't last nine seasons, that's for sure, right? It, 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 we'll give it one season. It'll go one season if all the romance is moved out of that show, right? Nothing's left. So even, even the, the show kind of a, of a generation, with the, t with the title Friends in it, still really lacks like a certain level of it being about friendship. And so maybe you argue with me as well, but I don't care. <laughs> and and here's, the, here's the problem we face, because you may be thinking like, okay, so wh why does this really matter that much, right? The problem we face is this, like we need deep friendships, right? Anytime, anytime that sort of biology, psychology, and scripture align to the, say the same thing. Like we'd better pay attention. We better pay attention. And here's what's true. People who don't have friendships or deep friendships, they die faster. People who don't have friendships or deep friendships, like the litany of psychological effects and the negative psychological effects that come with that, that get rolled into that are extensive. And, and thirdly, I'll make the case here that if we want to walk with God, if you want to walk deeply with God, that requires from us, it requires deep friendship, deep friendship. And friendship that is devoid of, of sort of the, the romantic entanglements of it, right? And so we just finished Valentine's Day. I'm sure that you hopefully, or maybe you didn't, um, share words of, of kindness with your significant other, right? Words that you didn't write, but words that you signed your name to from Hallmark, right? So we, 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 we communicated that. And sometimes we see things in those cards that are like, you know, you're the only thing that I need, right? You're the only friend that I need, right? Look to your spouse or your significant other and say, that's not true. Or don't, I don't know, whatever. That's not true though. It's not true that we need deep friendships. And again, like I said, I'm gonna make the case that if we're to walk with God deeply, if we're to walk with, if we're to walk with God, like deep friendships is one of the things that we need. It's necessary for us. And so um, the, the scripture as a whole takes a really, really high view of friendship. Um, the friendship is talked about both implicitly and explicitly all throughout the Bible. Sometimes we just miss it, but it's there. Um, and so we're going to look at some of the wisdom writings today in Proverbs. And then we're going to, like I said, jump to a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples that really redefines friendship as we know it, hopefully. Um, and so we're going to start in Proverbs. And we're going to start in Proverbs 20, 27, 6. And here's what it says. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. So if you were to just open your Bible and, and begin to read through Proverbs, it, it would be a weird experience because it would seem as though the author is just kind of jumping from topic to topic. But there's, doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any kind of rhyme or reason. And so what... To, to read the Proverbs effectively, a lot of times you have to have an idea in mind. 
um, and then begin to pull out ideas as you see them. They, they, they kind of show up in very cyclical fashion. And so there are times where the Proverbs talks about money. It talks about family. It talks about uh, your time. It talks about wisdom and it talks about friendship. And so we see the idea of friendship pop up at several different places throughout the Proverbs in a very cyclical way. And so um, we're going to pull a lot of those out and, and, and look at it and hopefully have a really big view of, of what friendship and how to be wise in our, in our friendships. Um, and so the other important part to, to think about is who the Proverbs were, Proverbs were written to. So the Proverbs were written to a culture in which family was really the center of everything. That everything, every aspect of their life revolved around family. That the idea of kind of even like breaking away and, and, and sort of starting your own family away from your family, that was a very foreign idea. It happened every so often, but it wasn't something, it wasn't something that, like, that our culture experiences. Um, and so for them, when they talk about friendship, they t- the friendship takes a, a, a really big new meaning when your understanding of family is what it is. And so friends were, were needed and they were necessary and they were, they were, seemed, they were, they were separated from family. And so your friend was someone who, who was the advisor. Your friends were the people who brought truth, which is why as we read some of these Psalms, we'll see like the, the essence of truth becomes this, this very high bar for friendship. Friends had to tell the truth. And so as you read that passage, faithful are the wounds of a friend. It seems kind of confusing. You don't really know what that actually means because it doesn't mean that the prerequisite to being a friend means that you wound your friends. That's not what's being communicated here. What's being communicated here is they are describing a conversation. They are describing an interaction between two people. They are comparing and contrasting what a friend would do in a situation versus what an enemy would do in a situation. And the onus and the the emphasis that's placed on the friend is that the friend is honest. Friends is, the friend is honest, which is a little bit different than maybe how our culture would sort of even characterize friendship. I think our culture, the message that's that's conveyed to us about friendship is that we, we minimize conflict with our friends through affirmation. And so what that means is, and I didn't do this, but I'm sure if you Google like what it means to be a good friend, on that list, you would probably see something that, that kind of described like supportive no matter what, encouraging no matter what, kind of walking with you no matter what, or, or you know, again, kind of affirming who you are no matter what. That is what a good friend does. And we automatically, if that is the way our culture sees friendship, then we automatically see a rub here with how the Bible describes what good friendship is. You see, because if a a friend is faithful and if a friend is honest, then there there may be times when we are wounded by their words, but those wounds will be for our benefit. Because on the flip side, we see what's the description of an enemy. It says that deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. It can also be translated as uh, excessive. Your translation may say excessive. So excessive and deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. An enemy. And so this is the idea about like who you have around you and, and what, how, what the level of honesty of the people around you, what is it? Because it's really, really important. Because here's the key. Honesty, when it comes to friendship, is of great value. Even, even the Hebrew word for friend is very closely related to the word secret. It's related to the word secret. And it's the idea that a friend knows who you are. They know your depths. Like they know who you want to be. They know what you're about. They know sort of the aims in which you live and the aim in which you walk and the aim in which you want to walk. And more importantly, they know specifically, they know you well enough, they know your secrets well enough to know and to see and to spot when you've deviated from it. When you decided to go a different way from the things that you've communicated, this is who I want to be, this is the direction I want to move. And so when a, when a friend, a faithful friend, speaks to that, that's going to hurt no matter what. We, we, as human beings, we don't like hearing bad things. We don't like hearing negative things. And so, but, but the Proverbs describes that friend is faithful and his wounds are faithful when they actually prevent us from walking over the edge, from walking over a line that we've drawn and said, hey, like I, I, I'm walking this way and, and, and I'm not about that. And the Proverbs actually describes the enemy as being the exact opposite. The enemy literally says, whatever you want to do, no matter how disastrous the results are, I'm in. 
right? So you, you want to do that? You want to do that horrible? You want to make this horrible decision? I'm in. I'm in. I'm with you no matter what, right? You want to blow up your marriage? I'm in no matter what. You want to you make this decision? It's going to cost you far more than you've thought about. This is going to cost you in ways far more than you've thought through. I'm in. Proverbs says that person is not a friend. That person is actually an enemy. And so when we think about friendship, we think the first thing that should come to mind when we think about our friends is, is honesty. Like, do we have honest people in our lives whose wounds, although they may hurt, will be faithful? So friends are honest. Friends are also present. They have to be present. Ecclesiastes uh, puts it this way. Ecclesiastes 4, he says, Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow or his friend. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. You see, one of the reasons that we need deep friendships to, to really walk with God faithfully is because more people can do more things. Right? So when we have good friendships, like more can be done in our lives. Like heavier weight can be carried in our lives. Because walking with God, we know that sometimes that's not a, that's, it's rarely a light endeavor. That with that comes weight. With that comes, comes hardship sometimes. With that comes suffering. With, and with that comes some joy too. But, but we carry those things far more effectively and far more efficiently when we have deep friendships. And this is the idea for us. And the point's kind of attached to, to, the, to the scripture there. But it says this, without present, and I would say without honest friendships too, without present and honest friendships, we cannot be the fullest version of ourselves in a lot of different ways, but it's certainly true spiritually. Cicero, who's considered one of Rome's kind of great, greatest known philosophers, actually writes a whole treatise on, on friendship. And, and he says this, and he's quoted, and, I, and it's quoted because it's literally what we just read from the scripture. He says that one of the highest duties of friendship was frankness or candor when it comes to reproof or counsel. And to the degree that tact or delicacy was used was the measure of a great friend. That second part's really, really important, right? Because we all know people who like to tell it like it is, right? We know that person, correct? Yeah, and, and that person sometimes like just tells it like it is and they don't actually really care the result of it. They're just, and they take pride often in just telling it like it is, right? You can have like one person like that in your life, right? More than one, nah, -uh. you need one. You can have one person like that in your life. But that's not the kind of friend that this is describing. This, this, this friend that's being described here, um, there, there's this element of connection there. That what happens to the friend also happens to me. Which is why deceit is such a big deal. Because if someone's being deceived, then you are the one being deceived. And you are the one deceiving. And you are walking with that person in deception. Whatever happens to you happens to the friend. And so the, the Bible is not describing you to be able to tell it like it is to your friends and ignore the repercussions or the, ignore the wounds that might follow. That's not what's being described here. But, it, but even then, this, the struggle that we have is that this is not the kind of friendship that we would naturally gravitate to. The friendships that we probably naturally gravitate to are one of sameness, where we surround ourselves with people who look like us, who are, you know, think like us, disagree on the same things that we disagree with, agree on the same things that we agree with, which is why like when you get married, like you have to get all new friends, right? Because like your wife doesn't like their friends and like all of a sudden like life stages have changed, right? And so you, all your single friends are just gone. They have to be gone, right? That happens both ways, by the way. It's not just a guy thing. But, but, but we, we, our natural inclination is to prioritize sameness, and so sometimes what we will tend to do is if someone kind of rubs up against us, right, a lot of times we'll tend to just kind of push them off. Right? And, and there is an idea of friendship that, that, that you need sameness in order to have a friend, right? Lewis talks about that as well, that the basis of friendship begins with the idea of you too, like you also walk that way, you also are gravitated to move towards that thing. But, but for you and I, we also have to have the ability to, to, to have some rub in our friendships, to have some friction in our friendships, for people to actually, where there's room to be honest. There's room for that. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to have, we'll have a poverty. The poverty of friendship will be the outcome. 
We will, have, we will have friends, but we will not have the richness of friendship that we are supposed to have, that we're called to have. Because friends, true friends are the ones that prevent us from reaching the bottom of ourselves. And, and so that's also kind of a check on our pride. Because here's what we have to admit. First of all, the, the, the only way we have good, deep friendships is that we have to admit that those are necessary for us. And, and for some reason, sometimes we, we have this pride center that, like, that, make, that says, like, we don't need people. I don't need anyone. But we do. And so the wisdom of Proverbs moves from, from sort of the idea, big idea of friendship to the, the idea of the quality of friends that we have. So here's what it says in, in Proverbs 13, 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, this is one of those ones that seems to make sense, right? That makes common sense, right? Something to the effect of um, you are the company that you keep. We've heard that before. So very, very similar ideas here. But the cultural rub here is probably this. The cultural rub is probably that this communicates to us that we are not necessarily just like the, the, the sum of our personal decisions, Sometimes we like to think that. Sometimes we like to think that, well, I, I am the product of my choices, that the decisions that I've made and the things that I've have invested in and the things that I've gravitated to, towards, that's who made me who I am. Um, but what this is communicating is something different. That, that's actually probably not as true as you wish it was. What's actually probably true is you are the product of the people that you are around. And again, this makes common sense when you, when you think about how you grew up. Like this starts very, very early on. Like as, as, as children are raised, children are raised and they are, are, they are a reflection of their parents. They're a reflection of that, right? Which is why like if you've ever gone to counseling, if you've ever done like some psychology stuff, like, that, like the, the minute they, they get into your story, they're digging into like what happened when you were a kid? What were your parents like? Because there's a good chance there, there's some stuff buried in there that, that you are acting on that you have no idea that you're acting on. Because it's the idea that, that we're not necessarily the summation of our choices. A lot of times we're the summation of our environment, of where we were and where we are currently. And we know that, we know this for a fact to be true, that around sixth grade, right, kids kind of move from parents being the most influential figures in their lives to peers being the most influential figures in their lives. That's empirically proven. Which is why, like, as parents of teenagers, like, you guys are super concerned about who they are hanging out with. And that's good because you're right on. That's accurate. Because we know that like who we are with is who, is, who, is who likely we are to become. Which makes choosing our friends really, really important. Who we choose as friends to be very, very important. Now, that's like, there's a caveat here, right? Because as we look at the life of Jesus, who we're supposed to imitate and mirror, like Jesus didn't hang out with people who loved God with all of their heart, soul, and mind. He hung out with some of those people. But there was a part of his life that was aimed at kind of reaching across divides. And that's, that's a lot of the stories that we've been reading. But his ratios were really, really good. He had good ratios, meaning he was around people who had that mindset, who knew what that mindset was. And the fact that he's Jesus, you're not Jesus, right? He's Jesus, so he can do that. And so this, this is not to say that we, we, we kind of close ourselves off from the world and from friendships of the world. That's not what we're to do here. But the ratios need to be right because who we are around will eventually be who we are, who we become. And so C.S. Lewis in his Four Loves, he, he writes a section specifically on friendship. And the Four Loves have to do with the, the Greek divisions of love and the Greek words for love. Um, but, but he said this, the next, bec- the, ne- the next best thing to being wise oneself is to live in a circle of those who are. And again, this is, this is true across all levels, right? If you want to be good at something, then the level of you being good at that will have a lot to do with who you do that thing with and the teacher that you choose. Or kind of if you're, if you're into cooking, like the, the measure that you will be a good cook will have to do with your teacher, but also has to do with the quality of your ingredients. I use that as, as an example because me and my wife just started taking a, not, not just, we just finished a cooking class together, something we thought would be fun. And we did that, and, and, and they have a section that talks about choosing the right ingredients, choosing vegetables, choosing meats. And me, like, I had, I had no idea what that was. Like, I just knew that if a tomato was squishy, like, don't pick that one, right? Pick a different one. 
Um, or if a tomato was the wrong color, don't pick that one, pick a different one. But then the meat thing just blew my mind, right? Because me, I'm like, what's the cheapest meat I can find? Like I'm, I'm looking for that sticker, that yellow sticker where it's like it's on sale, you know, super sale. Like I assumed that all that meat was the same, right? It turns out it's not, mind blowing, right? Turns out if you actually use really good meat, it tastes a whole lot better. It's crazy, I know. But that's the, that's the picture that we get here. And so the, the point for us is this, like our level of friendships will always rest on our ability to choose good friends. Like so this is the level in which we experience friendships will, will, will largely be based on our ability to choose good friends. And look, because we, we can choose bad friends. We, we, we can choose bad friends. We can choose friends who, who out of their own sort of, um, you know, insecurities, harm us, use us. We can choose those kinds of friends. And, and, and if you're sitting in this room, like that's happened to you. This is why friendship is such a hard thing to grapple with. It's because if we're people and we've lived long enough, like we've had a friend betray us. We've had a close friend who we thought was the kind of friend who we could confide in and trust in. We've had them burn us. We've experienced that before. But that doesn't mean we give up on that because we can also choose no friends. And again, that, that's, that's not any better. Refer back to the Ecclesiastes passage about falling alone. That's the picture we're given if we have no friends, if we choose not to invest in friendship. But we must choose good friends. And, and choose, the choosing of friends is, is, a, is a big deal. And it's, and it's, a, it's a theme that's played out in Psalms, uh, Proverbs rather, because we see... The writer of Proverbs differentiate, again, friend from family. And he does that because it has to do with the element of choosing, that friends are different than family. And so we see this a couple times. We see it in Proverbs 17, 17, where it says that a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Now, it's not saying that a friend is better than a brother. It's just saying that friends are different than a brother. And the difference is that we actually get to choose our friends. Friends are freely chosen, which is powerful. And, and, and we're also kind of pointing to the fact that like, look, depth over quantity is really, really important. And that's something that like you and I probably innately experience. In fact, if, if we could like encapsulate the, the issue with friendship that we had, I would argue that that's what it is. That when it comes to friendship, we worry far more about quantity than we do about depth. And that's literally what Proverbs 18, 24 is about. It says, a man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Because again, the truth is we could all name lots of friends. All of us, if you're in this room, you could name friends. You could name guys at work, like Bill from accounting is really, I'm friends with him. We talk about stuff, right? I have neighbors, you know, we have uh, people who are around us. We have, we have social circles that we could name friends out of maybe lots of friends that we can name out of, but that's not what's being discussed here. What's being discussed here is that like the depth of your friendships really, really matter. Because the difference between people who wish you happy birthday from afar and those who are present with you is immense. The difference between people wishing you well from afar and being in the hospital room with you is immense. The difference between someone offering condolences to you and being in your living room the moment something tragic occurs or being on your front doorstep the moment something tragic occurs is immense. And the person who can list off a bunch of friends but has no one that says that person is like a brother. That person would be there no matter what. The difference between having one of those versus a litany of people that you could point to and say, I'm friends with that person, sort of. There's an immense difference between the two. And so what do we do with this? What, what, what do we gain from this, right? Because um, the, the things that we know um, is that we need friends. We know we, know we need friends. And, and we know we need some wisdom in the choosing of friends. I love Tim Keller talked about friendship. He said that um, anytime you, you unpack the Bible about friendship, he says that two things come to mind for him. The, the emotions that he feels personally. First one is he feels a sense of longing. That when he talks about friendship and when he talks about the value of friendship, when he talks about the need for friendship, there's this longing that takes place in him for the desire to have someone that he is describing. And, and I think all of us can probably resonate with that. 
that when we talk about friendship, man, like we, we hope and we wish that we could have friends like that, that are being described like that. We want that. Something in us wants that. And then he also kind of, he says he also feels kind of the, the, the sense of, of just despair. And, and not, not despair that he can't have friends, but despair that when he looks in the mirror, he doesn't see the kind of friend that he would want. So in essence, when he, when he looks at himself and he assesses himself, he, he doesn't see the kind of friend who's present. He doesn't see the kind of friend who's honest. And it's like, I mean, I, I resonate with that too. Um, and so Jesus is going to give us some, some help, hopefully. Jesus is going to sort of discuss friendship with his disciples. And he's literally going to tie the very nature of human redemption, the very nature of the cross is going to be tied to friendship, which is how we know that when we talk about friendship, like it deserves our attention because Jesus is literally going to say, the sacrifice that I'm about to make has everything to do with friendship. And he does that in John 15. John 15, 12 through 17 says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves or servants, for the slave does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. And this is the command that I give to you, that you love one another. And this passage is really powerful for a number of reasons. The, the, the events in, in Jesus' life are about to almost hit fast forward. Like things are going to happen really, really quickly from this point forward. He's going to be um, arrested uh, he's going to be tried and he's going to be executed very quickly from now. And so this is one of the, one of the, th- one of the times where he, he really has a heart to heart with his disciples. And he begins to talk about life and what this, what this sacrifice is going to mean. And he ties it to friendship. But before this, he's talking about the kind of relationship that he has with the father and the kind of love that his father loves him with. And he points them and says, okay, now you, this love has been revealed to you. This is the kind of love that I want you to love one another with. And so Jesus points to the relationship or the friendship that he has with the Father as sort of the blueprint or the, or the call to deep friendship that they are supposed to encounter with each other. And we see the element of secret in there. We see like the, the call back to the original word of Hebrew, of friend, which means secret. We see Jesus begin to tell them, like, everything that God has shown me, I am showing you because you are no longer, I no longer consider you servants. I consider you friends. You're friends. And, and so because of this, I mean, we're able to look back and we're able to see how the thread of friendship is literally weaved all throughout the Bible, that literally Jesus likens the sacrifice that he's going to make here is on the, is on the basis of a restored friendship between man and God. And, and this is the, the picture and the blueprint of friendship for you and I. And we can go back even all the way to, all the way to, all the way to Adam, where it says that Adam and Eve walked with God. And whenever you see that word walking with God, that was the, literally the metaphorical picture of what it means to have a friend. And so then we see that Noah walked with God, that Abraham was called a friend of God, that Moses spoke to God face to face as he would with a friend, culminated in that Jesus says this sacrifice is on the basis of friendship, on the basis of restoring a right relationship. And so for you and I, we, we, we see this as it, it shifts our view of friendship as, as friendship is a blessing from God. It's a blessing from God. It's a shadow that the, the, the relationships that we might have with one another, the ways in which we might walk with one another would be a shadow of, of, of standing shoulder to shoulder in a friendship with God. It's supposed, to, it's, supposed to, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to call our minds to the goodness of God when we experience good, deep friendships. And if you've ever experienced that, like that's exactly as you reminisce and think about those things, that's exactly the feeling that sometimes that we feel. But Jesus is the ideal friend here. And so the, the, the idea for us is this, that our ability to understand true friendship comes from Christ himself because Christ is the ultimate friend. He is the ultimate friend who, who amidst betrayal still loves, who in the midst of denial 
still loves, who, who in the midst of abandonment still loves. Look, and he calls you his friend. And so we're able to receive the power of friendship, the power to live out friendship when we understand the nature of Christ's sacrifice for ourselves. When we see that picture clearly, then we have a greater understanding of friendship. And, and, and there's a greater possibility that we might be able to engage in these kinds of relationships that are so life-giving and such a blessing from God. That we might resist our natural inclinations to remain isolated, to remain walled off, to not be connected, to allow people in, to allow people to be honest with us. That we might actually embrace those things because they're a reflection of God's, of God's work in our lives that our friends become an extension of what, of what God wants to do in our heart. That's a beautiful picture. It's a compelling picture. And it's a, it can picture, it's a picture that hopefully if we see clearly, man, we're drawn to and we desire. And so how are we to live? So the first thing I would say first is for you to admit that you need friendships. Admit that you need deep friendships. And, and second, choose your friends wisely. Understand the difference between a good and a bad friend and choose them wisely. And then secondly, look to Jesus. See your friendships as, as a vehicle in which God's work can be furthered in your life because that's how it works. And so for many of us, it, it's about thinking, okay, who in my life, who is in my life right now that I've completely undervalued? Who is in my life right now who is steady and there and honest? And, and if you don't have that person, what I would suggest to you is that you begin to be that person for someone else and see where that takes you. That you might pray that God would bring people like that into your life. That you would pray that you would be made aware of those people who are already in your life that you've kind of pushed to the side for whatever reason. Because the truth is we, we need deep friendships. If we're gonna walk with God at the highest level, the fullest level, living life to the full with abundance, like we need deep friendships. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I come before you confessing that I am not always a good friend, that there have been many times in my life where I am the bad friend that is being described, that I am the one who um, is not present, maybe not even honest, um, where I hold back, where, Lord, um, I'm just even indifferent. So Lord, I pray for myself and people like me now, um, Father, that you would help us to look at your example, look at the truth of your word and become the friend that I need to be and to press in in deep friendships, Father, where, where, where my true self is known Father, so that, so that when I deviate, when I cross lines that I should not be crossing, I have someone there who knows me, knows what I want to be about, knows where I want to be going, and can speak faithful words to me. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that, that there are people here, Father, who feel friendless, who feel like they have no friends. There's not a person in the world who might care for them, Father. My one prayer for them is, God, you bring people in their life, God, who fit, who fit the category of friendship that's described here. And Father, my second prayer is that they would look in themselves and, and ask, Father, how, how they might change, how they might put themselves in different situations in which friends could be had and developed and invested in and made. That's so what I ask for, for wisdom for all of us, Father, that we choose friends, Father, that we, we, we decide that we need friends. We understand that we need friends, Father, and then we choose our friends with wisdom, Father, and then we look to you. We look to the power of friendship that comes from knowing Jesus. And we see that friendship is a shadow of the friendships that's to come as we walk with you, God. In Jesus' name.